digital world is digital disruption, but also digital opportunity. And if organizations are not viewing it as an opportunity, then it should be seen as a threat. Uh, and it's a very real threat if you're not taking it seriously. So 52% of the Fortune 500 companies listed in the year 2000 are not around today, they're gone. Some companies that were born in the cloud, companies like Airbnb, Uber, Churo, these guys have no assets. They're not coming from that traditional space. They're pure digital disruptors. Uh, Airbnb and Uber are probably common ones everybody's heard of. Is, hands up anybody who's heard of Churo. Very few, very few. I think I saw one hand actually, or two. So uh, let me tell you, Churo, um, they basically it's Airbnb for car rental. Yeah, so Airbnb, major disruptors in the hospitality space, Uber in the taxiing space. But for car rental, Churo, basically, you, you can register your car and I can rent your car when I'm on holiday or a business trip or whatever. So I get to choose from, I don't know, a simple run around to a, high, a nice sports car for the week or whatever it is, whatever car you want to rent. Essentially, value of Churo, as, in, as of January this year, was 18 billion. It was valued at 18 billion. Its two nearest competitors in that industry are Avis and Hertz. Together, their value amounts to 15 billion. So what a disruptor. It's already outstripping its two nearest competitors combined in terms of its value. Massive disruption. Okay, so development of self-drive cars. Who, who's driving this? <laughs> pardon the pun, who's, who's putting this into motion? Is it uh, Mercedes and Toyota and GM and so forth? No, it's IT companies. That, that, that's what's driving this business. It's a completely different shift into that digital leveraging. So the digitization of industry and commerce is here, and it's overtaken the market as we know it. Uh, as I said, I'm Steve Blanche. I'm the Chief Technical Officer at Ergo. And what I'm going to talk about is when we engage with customers on those workshops, like Jimmy has just outlined, we see typical commonalities in terms of the challenges in making our way onto that digital marketplace, that digital platform. And we've got to put constructions in place that help us create that digital platform. <coughs> so some stats, 7.5 billion current world population, 3.5 billion of those are internet users. And currently, it's estimated there are 55 billion digital identities out there. That's almost a 16 to 1 on average digital identities to, to, to 3.5 billion internet users. So there's a massive disparity there uh, in terms of digital identities versus actual services being used. So as I said, we've got to help our customers build that platform, construct the pieces that help them leverage this digital marketplace, this digital um, universe that we're moving into. So how do we do that? We look at the challenges potentially that are currently there. And significant challenge is mobility. So mobility goes hand in hand with agility. We need to be agile. So career time versus personal time, significantly blurred these days. I answer email over, over dinner. <laughs> much to the contemptuous look of my wife a lot of times, but I'm taking conference calls in the car and so forth. So the, you know, those times are significantly blurred. We, we, don't, we don't compartmentalize time anymore. Devices, commodities, I can't rely on this being my source of data and information and, and workability. It, it, it's a tool I use, but it's, it's a commodity. And then federate, collaborate, integrate. We work better together when we're more federated and collaborated with not just our colleagues, but our, our, our customers, obviously, but our suppliers, our vendors, our partners, us with Microsoft and so forth. We have to facilitate that. Next challenge is technical savvy. It's out there. We live in, a, in, a, in an environment now that's consumer-driven technical savviness. So everybody is using some kind of online presence. There's commercial sensitivities around that, and everybody's aware of that, uh, not just on the, on the business case, but on the, on the personal side. So we're all aware of the potential you know, bank, fraud, bank fraud, credit fraud, identity theft, and so forth. They're all legitimate parts of that technical savviness that we're all aware of. I'll tell you, my, my mother, she's 84. She has put online our whole an ancestry back to, I think, the late 1700s, and she's shared that with 
aunts and uncles and cousins all over the world. You know? And she tells you, I'm 84 and look what I've done. And she's really proud of it. And she actually she says I'm 85. She's not, she's only 84, but it seems to reverse when you get into senior year, you seem to want to be, the badge of olderness seems to be better. But anyway, um, and she was on to me, funny enough, on Sunday, I was talking about, uh, to a couple of colleagues outside about this, she was on to me on Sunday to say, is my stuff okay online? Because of the ransomware attacks that she became very aware of, obviously. But again, there's, I think it's called Silver Tech, that she's very, very technically, well, I, I think she's very technically aware, and she's very proud of it. Silver Tech? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I like the silver tech coming in me, so. Um, and ball tech, is there a ball tech? <laughs> okay, so what are the other challenges? The other challenge is multi-profile, multi-platform. So we've got to be able to compartmentalize. So I've got a, I've got a personal profile, I've got a business profile. Uh, and, and I operate on different platforms from laptops to tablets to, you know, I prefer Android on my phone and so on and so on. Uh, and we need to be able to facilitate all of those, obviously. But we have to be able to ensure that the privacy of those two component parts is, is ensured and it's isolated. I, I don't want my personal um, files, photographs, interactions uh, leaning over into, into the, my business space. They need to be compartmentalized. And I need to know they're protected. I need to know they really are secure. I need to be safe about that. Demanding. So we're all highly demanding. It needs to be now in real time. I can't afford to wait till tomorrow or next week for an email for information. I want it now. I need it now. We need to be dynamic. It needs that flexibility. I need to be able to access it, obviously, anywhere I am, at any time I want, and on, again, as I said, from any platform. And I, I don't just want data, I want something done with the data. I want it filtered properly. I want it, uh, I want it intelligent and smartened up before it comes to me. So I want to be able to use the leverage and the value of it. So they're the typical challenges we see. And then on top of that, when you impose the governance, risk and compliance obligations that we now have to adhere to, it just adds and increases the potential complexity that we have to deal with. So, but we have to deal with it. Because moving into that digital marketplace, that digital space, it's more exposure, it's more risk, so we have to impose more GRC. Okay, so meeting the challenges. As uh, James Comey, FBI director, was saying, there are two, two types of company, those, who've been, those, those who have been hacked and those who don't know they've been hacked. And, it's, and, and to be honest, when we see this interaction with customers, when we, when we look and we do security audits and so forth, and you see things like ex-staff that still have active accounts uh, within company environments, you think, God, you know, it's, it's a simple oversight, but it's such a massive security hole to, to still exist. Just the, the process isn't there, the adherence isn't followed, the governance isn't implemented. Actually, James Comey isn't actually the FBI director. He was fired two weeks ago by, uh, <laughs> by Trump. Um, but yeah, so meeting the challenge. So how, how do we look at that, that GRC? Uh, requirement and obligation, and as Rebecca was starting to, that the GDPR and so forth, that they're going to impose on us. So we've got to design policy. We've got to enable adoption. It's got to be used by people. We've got to track the data. We've got to audit its usage, and then we've got to report on that compliance. So, so let's look at those in a bit more detail. Designing policy. So regulatory policies like FinTech, MedTech, RegTech, uh, and obviously the GDPR, are going to outline what we need to be compliant with, industry standards. We have to impose security at layers. So it's not enough to say we've got good firewalls or we've got a really up-to-date antivirus uh, solution or anti-malware solution and so forth. We've got to impose now security because of the risk and the exposure is so much greater at every single layer. The identity layer, the application and device layer, and then the data layer itself. And then simplified usage, obviously for, we've got to get people to use this because if we don't enable people to use it properly, we're back to shadow IT, which again is this enabling adoption. How do we do that? How do we help them do that easily? Um, and I'll be talking, we'll be demonstrating a little bit about rights management, a technology from Microsoft that I've used over the years, I've been in IT a long time, and it was a difficult technology to not just implement, but to get people to actually use, because it was cumbersome, it was very complex. Uh, but, but if we can simplify that, 
we have categorization of data. So do you know if a data is, is general data, or is it internal only, or is it confidential, and so forth? And then we, we label that, make it easy for people to see and understand where they do assign labeling and categorizations to their data. And then ID integration. So whether I'm accessing that internally on-prem or through the cloud or whatever, it all has to be integrated. I have to have the same kind of experience in order for me to use it consistently and know I'm being protected and my data is being protected. And then we've got to track that data. So what happens to it? We've got to monitor where it goes, uh, who's accessing it, and so forth. And we've got to record that. As Rebecca was saying, recording now is, is definitely an incumbent upon us as IT, as IT services. Uh, we have to be able to subsequently then audit what happens to that uh, data, analyze its usage, analyze the usage patterns, uh, the profiles, where it's being accessed from, uh, times, dates, locations, and so forth, and remediate. So obviously during auditing, when we're seeing what's happening to our data, we need to be able to do something about it. We need to be able to respond, uh, enhance um, security, or restrict usage, whatever is appropriate for what we're seeing in, in the auditing of the usage of our data. And then finally, report on compliance. So this is a key piece. Um, we've, got to make, we've got to be visibly demonstrating that we are imposing these uh, compliance requirements, governance over our data. And, and as I say, it's a key piece because we, we'll have to share with the regulator. You know, the GDPR coming in next year, we're going to have to be able to demonstrate it. So you, know, you won't be punished for necessarily a breach. There's no security devices and protocols that you can implement that are going to be 100% impenetrable. That's an impossibility. However, if you're not taking the steps to reasonably secure and demonstrate that you are being proactive and reporting and analyzing uh, and demonstrating that you are imposing those GRC requirements, that's where you're going to be punished. That's, where, that's why, as Rebecca was saying, those fines are so big. Because the, the, the European Union is looking at, the thing, looking at it from the point of view of, if you're not able to secure that data, then you shouldn't be in charge of that data. And fines like that are not just punishment fines. They're, they're going to put you out of business. You know, nobody wants 4% of your revenue is massive. So that, that's why people are paying such close attention. And that's why it's critical that you, we, we demonstrate that visibility, that transparency of we're imposing that governance. Okay, so we're going to look at um, some of the, the ways that we, we typically get involved with helping customers solve some of these problems and some of the typical challenges. And to help us with that, so I've got Jerry Hampson, he's Microsoft MVP, senior consultant at Ergo, and he's going to walk through some demonstrations with us of us implementing some of the practicalities of this from a Microsoft technology perspective. First thing we're going to talk about is multi-factor authentication. So again, going back to what I was saying, bit the the layered security. We're going to start off with identity. So identity is the core piece. We're all unique. You know, that goes back to that three and a half billion, I think it was, internet users, uh, 55 billion personal or digital identities. Uh, realistically, it should ideally be down to one, and that should map across all usage, business and personal. So let, let's focus on getting that first layer right. How do we ensure we've got a, a security and governance layer at the identity level? Jerry's going to walk us through that now with multi-factor authentication. Sure, thanks Steve. So MFA reduces risk and meets compliance requirements. You can protect services like Office 365, Salesforce, Dropbox and many, many other SaaS apps. So, you can, and you can also use it in conjunction with other technologies like uh, VPN for example. It works by introducing a second authentication into the process which could be a t telephone call, SMS message, a mobile app perhaps, or even biometrics, which, which Steve mentioned. So we're going to have a look at the phone call option. Now, I've received a link to a SharePoint doc, and I'm just going to open it. And we're going to be prompted for with two ch challenges. So first challenge is my credentials. Oh. And the second challenge. Please be using Microsoft sign in verification system. Please press the hash key to finish your verification. Your sign in was successfully verified. Goodbye. Thank, thank you, kind lady. 
and and we're in, and we're, we're, we've opened uh, the SharePoint doc. It's very, very effective. Now, I'm going to mute this phone. I was standing here hoping the wife wouldn't call me. <laughs> Steve. All right, uh, and as Jerry said, that was a simple demonstration of just imposing multi-factor authentication. Again, you're, you're adding another layer of security at the identity level. And you know, we've done a callback demonstration there. What's definitely going to come more to the fore is the biometric integration. Um, so, so, you know, retinal scanning, uh, facial recognition, voice ID, and so forth, very much going to become more in vogue uh, and integrated with, with multi-factor authentication. So, next area we're going to look at is securing at the next layer. So, the applications and the device, or, or the device itself, uh, and both of those. So, what we're going to look at here is a scenario of choose your own device. So, potentially, if your company issues a device, a smartphone, tablet, whatever it is, how are we going to impose management and control over that kind of scenario? So, Jerry. Sure, so conditional access, it restricts access to the corporate resources subject to devices uh, achieving a certain level of compliance. And you will be the ones that will actually uh, determine what that means. You'll determine exactly what a compliant device is according to your own requirements. For example, you can prevent access to corporate resources from a jailbroken or a routed device. So the example we're going to see now is for uh, conditional access to Exchange Online. Uh, so I've configured a policy that this device must be password protected and encrypted before email can be accessed. And for that to happen, the device must be enrolled in Microsoft Intune. So if we look at the device, I have successfully created an email profile on this unmanaged device. That's the key, this is not a managed device. But when you have a look there, there is only a single email in the mailbox telling me that the device must be enrolled before I can get the rest of my corporate mail. Um, and it gives instructions to get started and how to actually enroll the device. So this is a very powerful way to force your users to enroll their devices in this uh, CYOD scenario. Steve. Okay, so there we're, we're, we're demanding that the device be enrolled and managed by us before we would allow you access to our business applications and data and so forth. That, that's not always a viable scenario. And, and to be honest, managing device MDM is becoming less a focus in industry uh, in the marketplace today. The focus is definitely moving more towards, again, the identity, the applications and the data and away from these commodity type devices. So, so looking at the next type of scenario, which is, is more, more typical, and it's going to be more and more typical, is bring your own device. So in bring your own device, we still need to be able to impose the same level of control and management, and yet let people choose their own platform, potentially integrate their personal with their business, but in a, obviously in a compartmentalized way. And that's where we look at. Uh, mobile application management, and Jerry's going to show us how we can potentially still impose that same level of control uh, and management uh, on a bring BYOD scenario. Jerry? Sh sure, so, so as I said, this is an unmanaged device. Um, so mobile application management, or MAM policies, uh, they're designed to prevent corporate data leakage. Uh, now, I've installed Outlook on this device and configured it with a profile for the corporate mail. So I'm just going to save an attachment from my corporate mail to the device. And I can't. See the bottom of the screen there, cannot save this device because it's unmanaged. Uh, if I try and copy and paste then, for example, some uh, content from the body of the mail, I'm going to try and paste this into an unmanaged app. I have no control over this app. And I can't. Organization data cannot be pasted here. Okay, so that's mobile application management. But there's a really cool feature of mobile application management that we look at now. Outlook and a number of the other Office apps, uh, they support multi-identity. So what that means in Outlook, for example, is I can create multiple profiles uh, for my corporate and my personal mail. And within the personal mail then, um, I should be able to do those actions. So let's have a quick look. I've configured one here as well. And this is my personal mail. So if I do the same thing and I try and save the attachment, this time I'm able. And this time, I should be able to paste this information straight into the unmanaged app. So multi-identity is a really cool feature that was um, uh, released last year. Steve? 
So just to remap that, so we, we've still got a single device, uh, consumer device, whatever it is, but we've compartmentalized the personal versus the, the corporate or, or business applications. Uh, they, don't, they don't appear any differently to the, to the consumer, but they are virtually locked away in terms of their functionality and, and workability. So, so now we've looked at the identity layer and imposing security at the identity layer. We've looked at the applications and devices. So next thing we need to look at is the data, the data itself. So the data is obviously uh, significant importance. It's the most important piece, essentially, that we're, we're going to be working with, obviously. So going back to how we impose governance and security on our data, we've got to write, we've got to put policies in place that basically allow us to align with compliance requirements like the GDPR, for example, and then create the policies that reflect those compliance requirements. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're, we're going to demonstrate, or Jeremy's, Jerry's going to demonstrate, potentially how that gets created. Uh, and this is through Azure Information Protection and Rights Management. Jerry. Sure. So we're going to look at a couple of scenarios here using Azure Information Protection. So the first one will be confidential documents. Now, I've configured a policy to consider certain keywords as confidential. The word payroll is one of those words. So I've created a Word document, and I've entered some text with the word payroll. So when I go to save that document, when I go to save that document, immediately I'm prompted to... Can you see that? Yeah, immediately I'm prompted to, uh, to change that document into a confidential document uh, because of the word payroll. So, so this, this is part of that user enablement. So as I said before, rights management uh, used to be extremely difficult, not only just to implement, but to get people to actually use. Now we're helping them by seeing, we're suggesting to them, obviously from Jerry's demo, payroll being a sensitive word. So do you want to do something with this? Should this not be a confidential document? It could be a credit card number. So we just want to use credit card number because everybody seems to use that kind of example. But you tailor it to what specific in your organization. It might be internal um, IP that you, you, you want to protect in that way, whatever it is. Sure, it's also important to, to note that there's two buttons there, uh, change now and dismiss. That was my choice. Um, we can force the user to, to do this. But in, in this particular case, we've given the option that they can, they can dismiss it if they wish. So if we change that, and the document has now been marked uh, highly confidential, uh, the watermark is customizable, so you can enter whatever text you like yourself, but it's now a confidential document. So if I save that document, and then I'll just open it again, And we'll see now that the confidential template has been applied to that document, no matter where it goes. Within Azure, I just want to show you the options that you have for creating the conditions that define what's confidential. So there are some built-in choices. Um, you can see there, you, a credit card. You can choose SWIFT code, social security number, IBAN, or ABA routing number. And with the custom option, you can enter any keyword you like. To, to make that document confidential, okay? So the second scenario I want to, I want to uh, look at is for shared documents. So I'm opening another document, and I'm going to create a shared document. I'm going to share it with Steve, because we collaborate all the time. And I go protect custom permissions. So here's where I protect the document. And here are the permissions. So viewer only, there are a lot of choices I can make here. I really trust Steve, so I'm going to say co-owner. Steve's email. And the document may not always be relevant. Let's say it's financial projections, for example. Uh, next week, they may not make sense. So we can expire the document. Um, I'm going to give it a week. And then I apply the permissions to the document. OK. So I'm going to save that document.
Okay? And I can see straight away that this is now a restricted access document. I can change the permissions to allow anybody else and give them viewer, uh, co-owner rights, or whatever it is. And when, what I'll now do when I'm finished with this is I just email this document to Steve, and no matter what he does with it, I know that um, he can't forward it to somebody else to, to look at. Okay? Yeah, so again, the, the security is embedded into the data itself. We're not relying on external systems, protocols, and so forth. Jerry's embedded the security into the data. So, so once he's done that, essentially now, as, as we said before, we need to audit. So what's happening to this data? Um, what, what do we know about it, and what can we do about it uh, when we do uh, potentially um, identify anomalies or inappropriate access to the data? So Jerry. Sure. So this is the Azure tracking center where I can see a list of all the documents that I've shared. So I can go into one of the documents and I'll see that it has been viewed once. Um, I can look and see where. I can see that document was viewed in Ireland uh, by Steve Blanche and that's great. If I saw some an anomalies I can, on the bottom right, I can revo revoke access to that document. So I'm in total control of the documents all the time. So again, it goes back to we need to be able to demonstrate that we are, we are tracking, we are auditing, and we can report accurately on what's happening with that. Sure. So again, it goes back to Rebecca's um, uh, talk where she was uh, outlining our, our obligation now with the GDPR is going to be able to demonstrate this. We must report. Yeah, and you can see the kind of information you get in the report, the document name, when you shared it, who you shared it with, um, successful attempts to open it, uh, last activity, for example, and the status of the document, whether it's active or expired. So it's all the information that you'd need um, to remain compliant. Okay, so essentially that, that's our demo wrap-up. Um, and that gives you an outline of us bringing you to the Agile Edge in terms of putting the platform and the, the framework in place that we can enable people to, be, to leverage the digital platform, to be secure in that, to be tracked in that and have the confidence that they can use their identity to access our applications and data in a secure um, and manageable way.